Christopher Nolikin at Belgium Veterinary Hospital. Hi, I'm Lindsay Benzulo. Talking today about allergies and pets. Spaying and neutering your pet. Pet weight management. And we're going to talk today about pet summer fun and safety. You can... uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but doctor. Mm-hmm. So you got a good girl. You got a lot of treats. A lot of TV treats. Up on that table. <laughs> Hi. Hey, everybody. We're live on Facebook. <laughs> this is very exciting. So, I'm Dr. Christopher Nolikin. I'm Lindsay Renzulo. Um, we are here at Bulger Veterinary Hospital, actually in Krista's office. This is the first time that we have ever Facebook lived, and we're sort of moving our podcast yeah, show over to... Ooh, hang on. Oh, shoot. We just have a little bit of an extra sound here. Let's put so that on mute. Our... All right. Well, now we're fine. Oh, so, we're on. We're on a delay. I can see this picture here don't, is a delay. Don't we can't it. even look at it here. Okay. So, a few bugs we have to work out, <laughs> but it'll all be good. Um, so, we're here today, and this is season two of the podcast. Yep. We're very excited. Have um, have us back and, and be here doing um, sort of a different format, but a little bit exciting because we've never done a Facebook Live ever before. So, you just have to be careful that we don't do things that need to be edited out because we can't. And otherwise, it should be fun and a little less formal than yeah. before. Yeah, so, I like it. Uh, so one of our topics today was diabetes. Yeah, I, we thought it would be an interesting topic for everybody because we've done a few, the last few episodes haven't been super medical. So we thought maybe we could get back into more of the medicine um, part of it. And um, diabetes is just something that I think a lot of people are familiar with. Obviously, people say, oh, you're, you know, you're diabetic. You hear the commercials. You have family members that might be diabetic. And there are some similarities uh, in veterinary medicine, but there's also a lot of differences, mm -hmm. too. And so we thought we would just sort of break it down a little bit for everybody, for our viewers and our listeners, um, to talk about the differences of, of veterinary medicine and um, different species that have differences. So as far as uh, diabetes goes, um, there are still in veterinary medicine two main types. There's type 1 and, and type 2. Um, and cats and dogs are very different with how they sort of present. 99% um, of dogs are going to have type 1 diabetes, um, whereas with cats, you get a much higher percentage that will have uh, type 2 diabetes. So let's go back and say what diabetes is. Oh, it's a good so, one. Yeah. Diabetes mellitus. There yep. are actually other kinds of diabetes, but diabetes mellitus is um, broken down. It's like excessive sugar in the bloodstream. Yep. But because of an insulin deficiency, either we say a relative or an absolute insulin deficiency. So insulin is this like key that opens up the cell to allow sugar into it. Sugar is essential for all cell functions. So you can't have the cells operating properly without sugar. So the insulin is what opens up the door to the cell. If you don't have insulin, then the glucose can sit, you can have all the sugar you want in the bloodstream. It will never get into the cell and feed the cell. Mm -hmm. so that's what we're trying to do. And so what you'll get is you get really, really high glucose levels in the bloodstream. Right. And, and it can't go anywhere. So it, they pee it out. It makes them drink excessively because they're peeing excessively. And that sugar just has nowhere to go. And high sugar in the bloodstream is not good for any other cells, the, the blood vessels, the eyes. Especially in humans, these are known to be organ problems yep. associated with high blood sugar. Yeah. Um, so then, so when we say absolute or relative, absolute insulin it's deficiency means... There's no insulin. Yeah. So the pancreas, which is a really important organ, is producing that insulin. So in type 1 diabetes, you are not getting any insulin from, no insulin at all. from that pancreas. Right. It's just not giving it uh, to you. And then type 2 is relative. And you think about that. That is the most common type of insulin that we, uh, diabetes that we yep. see in people, which is you've, you know, usually it's related to overweight or obesity, sometimes other metabolic disturbances. There's some where, lack of exercise or... You know, you're, you're kind of giving your body a little too much stimulation to produce insulin and your pancreas gets gets tired or the cells just are like, oh, so much insulin, so much sugar, we're going to downregulate everything and the insulin's not going to work as well. Mm -hmm. So your pancreas might be pumping out plenty of insulin, but your, your cells just are tired mm -hmm. and they, they can't react to it. It's a good way to explain it for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so in our canine patients, you know, majority of those patients are going to be having that type 1 or 
absolute insulin deficiency. So these are dogs that come in that um, there's been a lot of thought process and maybe there's like a genetic component to it. Certain breeds seem to have it a little bit more than others. So, you know, things How like How do you poodles. pronounce Sam- Samoyed? Is it Sam- Samoyed? I say Sam- Samoyed. Me too. Okay, so Samoyeds have a increased... Samoyeds do? I say that because there's this caster that does the, um, like one of the dog shows, the, the Thanksgiving yeah. dog show. He's always a Samoyed. Oh, no. It I sounds, it's, Sammy. it's almost like there are actually a lot of pronunciation yeah. issues. Like, anyway, I don't know how you say no, dachshund. Do with diabetes, but Samoyeds yeah. or Samoyeds get type 1 diabetes. Right? They do, yep. And poodles and, um, you know, little, so. Little, white, like little white fluffy dogs. Yep. Maltese, Bichon. Yeah, but yeah, Bichons, yep. Definitely, yeah. They, they're more predisposed to it. So there is, in, in canine patients, some sort of a genetic link. You know, and that's true in people too. So yeah. People with type 1 diabetes, often there's a higher incidence of type 1 diabetes if your parent has it or a grandparent has it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas that's not, that's also true much more in type 2 diabetes, but. It's true. Yep. But um, in type 1 diabetes. And in cats, I don't think there's really as strong of a genetic pull with cats. They're not, they don't really know yet, you know, with cats, like some. Uh, at least from the, the literature search that I was doing, it wasn't saying that a certain breeds are way more predisposed. So cats are a little I, bit I different. Think just the number of cats out there in the world that are purebreds is yep. so much lower than the number of cats that are just the standard domestic short hair or mixed breed that it's, it's a little hard. So most of the diabetic patients we see, I agree with you, are not a purebred cat. They're just a, a domestic short hair. Yep. We don't always know the parentage of cats because of how <laughs> they are. It's true. Very true. <laughs> And so you can't always say, did this cat produce the diabetic? Right. That is very, very true. Right. So with those dogs that are type 1 diabetic, I mean, we typically see these guys presenting sort of the middle of their life, right? Wouldn't you say sort of yeah, middle age to a little bit older, yeah. maybe like 7 to 9 or so, that they come in and they present with diabetes. So what are some of the big clinical signs? You said it earlier a little bit, but yeah, so if you have a diabetic patient, what are some of the big things that you see? Excessive drinking, excessive peeing, and eating, but still losing weight, like eating a lot, usually ravenously. And so think about that. Mm -hmm. We have blood sugar circulating. It's spilling out into the urine, which is making them pull all their fluid into the pee and they're peeing a ton. So in order to maintain their hydration, Mm -hmm. they are drinking Mm -hmm. because they don't want to get dehydrated and they're eating, but none of that sugar is feeding the cells. So the cells are still screaming out, I'm hungry and the dog is still going to eat. But all the sugar that it eats, all the food that it eats get met- gets metabolized into sugar and gets peed out in the urine. Yep. And so none of that nutrition is actually going to feeding the cells. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. So, so th- I had a family member yep. diagnosed with this who had all of those classic signs, but I did not say, <laughs> you I didn't, bet you have diabetes. You didn't put it together. No. No. <laughs> no. I just was like, go to the doctor. Maybe it's kidneys. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. So type 1 diabetes. So, type 1 <laughs> so after you get these dogs, we can diagnose it, and we can diagnose it fairly readily on just some standard blood testing and urine yep. testing. Um, the way that we treat with our canine patients is we have to administer insulin because if you remember, type 1, they can't produce the insulin, so we need to, as their owners, as their vets, give them insulin via insulin shots. And so it's injection, so there's no oral product, nothing that will replace that insulin. It has to be injections. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't survive the stomach to be given orally. Um, but that sounds daunting, but it's not actually that bad. It really isn't that bad. So. I actually just had a patient, too, that we diagnosed um, with diabetes maybe a few months ago. And I saw the owner in the waiting area the other day. It actually what made me think of doing diabetes as a podcast. And she said, you know, I really, when you said he was diabetic, I thought it was going to be the end because I couldn't imagine myself you know, administering insulin on a regular basis. And she said, he doesn't even care and I can do it Mm -hmm. because the needle is so small and the dogs really don't seem to mind. I think they get in spots where like where we give vaccines and you know how your dog usually doesn't react too much to vaccines. Yeah. It's even smaller than the vaccine needle too. It's so tiny. Even while they're distracted eating often. Yeah. Right. So it's actually, a lot of times, sometimes dogs like it because they know they're going to get their meal as they're getting their insulin. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, it is, it is something where you ha- we have to administer the insulin. There's all different insulin types that are available out there, um, commercially available. And when you say there's different insulin types, it just is different ways that we sort of have formulated that insulin. They all de- act a little bit differently. And so cats might have a certain insulin that works a little bit better for them than maybe a, a canine patient would. Um, but your vet will be able to help you determine what's the appropriate insulin for your pet. And then diet is often important. Yep. But the biggest thing with dogs, 
you know, we do these high fiber diets that maybe prolong the digestion of the of the carbohydrates, yep. and that's all great. But realistically, with dogs, just consistency is important. Mm-hmm. It's just that they have to have the same every day, always. Because yep. if you give them more of like table scraps, yep. like, let's say you give them pasta one day, their blood sugar is going to perhaps spike that day. But you can't know that always, and you can't regulate them the way that we do with people, and so you're going to end up with these spikes and these drops and you're not going to be able to regulate them as well. So it's just the same amount of food, the same food every day. And on the day that they feel sick, we have to be very careful. They're, they're sicker than an otherwise healthy dog. And we just have to be more proactive in bringing them in and to be seen. Yeah. And I think some of the big pitfalls with regulating diabetes and we can go into cats too a little bit. I don't want to skip over them. (gasps) Oh, exercise. Oh yeah. So we'll, we'll oh, we'll go that. back to that. I yeah, I like that. For that one. Oh, good. Right. Um, but as far as some of the pitfalls go with diabetes, uh, you know, like Dr. Van Allen mentioned, you know, very often in humans, uh, people are monitoring their glucose levels, you know, multiple times a day, or they're adjusting how they're sort of eating throughout the day and giving themselves. In animals, we really kind of manage it a bit differently. Yeah, you could, but like truly imagine checking your dog's blood sugar like eight times a day because that's how often people will have yeah. it. It's, it's a little bit daunting, and I think that a lot of people would just say, no, no, I can't do this. So we try. We can't manage them as perfectly because we just realistically know that we we can't. And the we dogs, can't ask that of you. You know, the dog's talking about, you know, being compliant. You know, they're very compliant for the insulin shots, but as far as, like, getting blood sticks, some patients blood aren't sugars, as compliant yeah. for that, yeah. for the blood sticks, for the blood draws, to, to actually manage that blood sugar. So, you know, we tend to sort of have a standard dosing of insulin that we will give you um, to do twice a day. And, you know, as far as adjusting that on your own or on the fly, don't, please don't adjust it, on it can really send their body in, a, in, mm. in, you know, in a, can send them for a little bit of a loop. So, you know, keeping their food the same, keeping the insulin dose the same, you know, knowing, oh, if I give them a big meal, I'm then going to give them a lot more insulin tweaking it on your own like that can sometimes set you up for failure. Yeah. And the insulins are generally much more long acting that that we use in dogs compared to people. People will tweak based on each. They'll check their blood sugar. They'll say, okay, this combined with what I'm going to eat now, I'm going to give myself this much rapid acting insulin. We don't do that in dogs. We're using long acting. So you're not going to be able to fix a problem instantaneously by just adjusting the dose of insulin. So we adjust the dose based upon what we call glucose curves, Mm -hmm. and that's we get your dog to come in for a day, we check the blood sugar every two hours. So we're basically, think about it, it's a curve that you're seeing what the peak is, how long the insulin lasts, when the low point is, and then we might say, okay, sounds perfect, or as perfect as we can get. Yep. (laughs) Yep. I had a family member remind me of this, that perfect is different for every dog. (laughs) Yes. Um, And then um, we may make you increase, we may make you decrease, um, but you can see that that could be a different situation for a dog too, so that day they have to eat their normal amount, yep. they're not probably exercising as much, they're in a cage, yep. they might be stressed, so that can be not perfect either, so it's it's as good as we can yeah. do. Yeah, we, we tend to, to have them ride a little bit on the higher end with their glucose values, because having an increased glucose in your system isn't ideal. Like, you know, Dr. Benalik and I mentioned, you know, you can have other organs that can really suffer if your glucose is consistently really, really high. So we try to measure, we kind of try to manage them on the higher end because on the flip side, if we are, their glucose levels are really, really low, they can, they, die. They can yeah. die. So it's a much more serious, you know, um, adverse effect that you can have if you're really over-medicating them with way too much insulin, um, seizures, tremors, you know, death are are real things. And so we don't want to be overdosing them on insulin at home. So we kind of manage them on the higher end. The question about exercise is interesting because we don't always address that much with our patients, Mm. but my family member who's diabetic, uh, exercise dramatically increases your insulin sensitivity. Yeah. So, you know, if you go for a long bike ride, that, that diabetic person might not actually take insulin at all. Yeah. They might eat, they might have to actually eat to maintain their blood sugar higher. And so it's again, consistency. So the same as you would feed consistent meals, you want to try to keep your exercise consistent for your dog. So if they always go out for a one mile hike every yeah. day or whatever, do that every day. And on the day that you don't fine, maybe the blood sugar will be a little bit higher. Right. But <clears throat> what you want to be careful about is those days that you do decide we're going to have an epic yep. hike yep. or something. That might be a day that you do carry a little bit of extra, you know, 
food around. Yes. Um, something, you know, we, we don't necessarily always need to do something. They had mentioned like a honey stick or something. You could. Uh, usually it's just about having a few extra treats yep. and not worrying as much if the if you give a little bit of extra food on that particular day. It's, it's good, though, to know because I don't feel like I... That's one of the things I, I don't definitely don't it, yeah. hit home well, as much. And, and, again, those people, you're, you're keeping them tightly regulated within this, like, 180 to 120 range yep. where if that exercise really kicks in and now they go down to 60 or 50, it's a big deal. Yeah. Whereas if a dog is kept between... 250 and 100 like yeah. they there's a lot more wiggle room so yeah. it's not as big of a deal sure yeah definitely true but cats on the other hand mm -hmm. so that's sort of dogs remember type one more often with dogs um but with cats they are actually a little bit different yeah. so a lot of cats are more type 2 diabetes which a lot of people are aware of because it happens more often in people that become type 2 mm -hmm. diabetics so talking about type 2 diabetics you know i have a diabetic cat well he's <laughs> on and off diabetic he's become diabetic now five times, and I've gotten him into what we call remission five times. Uh, he's a little bit atypical, though. He is so, a bit atypical. Um, so cats, we more commonly see it's it's the overweight cats. They're they, inside. You know, they're hanging out. Right. They're eating some food. They're just laying there, and the best thing in their world is eating. Yep. And every time you go into the kitchen, they come into the kitchen and go, Brr! am I getting fed now? <laughs> and it's only like noon. And it's like six hours till they're going to eat, but they're hungry. Some of them are persistent, too. Yeah. Um, so we, <laughs> in these cats, they do actually react very well to some of the same things that humans yeah. do. It, with the exception that we almost always need to treat them with insulin. And humans, we use these oral medications and, and various different things far before you would ever use insulin in a human. Yeah. But human, cat diabetics, they go on insulin right away. Um, because that is the quickest way to get their blood sugar back into control. Yeah. Um, the oral stuff just doesn't doesn't work as well. It doesn't work as well. And, I mean, there there are people that will try to opt to go that route. Um, it's just never really recommended, you know, trying to do a diet, you know, with, on their cats and do these oral these oral medications to help control that, the, that glucose level. It's just not the recommended mm -hmm. route for kitties. So we do tend to start them on insulin right yeah. away. And the thing that I've found the most success with in cats, so cats actually can be cured of their diabetes, or at least... We say remission because they're always a little bit prone to going back into diabetes Definitely. if any of those conditions change. But we put them on a very low carb diet, and sometimes that means just wet food mm -hmm. only. A specific wet specific wet foods have low carbs. There's commercial diets, there's prescription diets, yeah. all of them have low carbs, and we start them on insulin. Yeah, and then there's a strong percentage of those cats that actually become not diabetics true. once you get their blood sugar back in the control zone and maybe get a few pounds off. It's really true. I mean, it's great. And that's the one good thing about cats as opposed to dogs, because once you diagnose a dog, they're going to be on insulin for life. Yeah. Um, but with those cats, they can sort of go into remission. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit scary in some sense that you have to be aware that your cat can go into remission, so they might not need that insulin anymore. Yeah. So if you are continuing to dose them and they can actually go hy hypoglycemic, so have that low blood sugar, it is something to be very mm -hmm. aware of. And I can't say, so recently I've had a few cats diagnosed with, with diabetes that you have to be very, very, very on top of it and proactive right from the very beginning to get them into remission. Yeah. So if you kind of like, okay, we start them on the insulin and then we wait a little bit longer to get them in for their blood sugar curves. And so these patients that I've had recently that were newly diagnosed diabetics, like it took, it took six months to get them mm. really regulated. And even then I wasn't feeling like they were fully regulated, but I wasn't really sure if, if the people could manage them that tightly. Those cats aren't going to become no. non-diabetic. They're going to yeah. stay diabetic forever. Yeah. Um, and cats, I feel, they tolerate high blood sugar really well, except for when they don't and they become what we call DKA. Mm. So we still, they're a little bit trickier. I feel like cats can be really rewarding, but also a little bit trickier because you'll have this just once in a while, you'll have a cat that's diabetic that, you know, their blood sugar is a little on the high end, but you tolerate it, and then they come in and they're super sick. Their blood sugar is way out of control. They're dehydrated, and maybe they have something else that caused that. But. And that's good to point out. I mean, DKA, we say that it stands for, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis, and it's the one thing you just don't want your diabetic patient to go through. Right. Um, you know, it doesn't happen that often mm. in people with type 2 diabetes, but it can happen I with think these kitties. I think it's actually, oh, but, does they, it but they warn more? people with diabetes. That it can like, happen. Oh, you can't go off, of, like if people who are on insulin pumps and so yeah, they stop true. the insulin pump and they get DKA. They, right yeah, I mean, it's a dangerous good. condition. It's life-threatening. Um, you know, it requires hospitalization and, you know, days of treatment. And so it can be a quite a, of a 
You don't want to see your pet go through that. It's, it is treatable. It's not easily treatable, and it's not cheaply treatable. Yeah. So some some cases, those are cases that the owners end up calling it quits and not going forward because it's just it's it's a week in the hospital. It could cost yeah. like many thousands of dollars to treat. Yeah. So. So that's sort of diabetes in a nutshell. I, it's kind of wrapping up right around time. Yeah. Let's see if we have any other questions. I don't think we have any other questions so. right now. All right, pretty good. <clears throat> so then our second smaller topic was a fun one. We which found it a fun. Uh, we came up with mistakes that very well-meaning people make in, right. their pet, in their pet care. And I think, you know, it's so important to sort of bring it up now, maybe listening, you know, our viewers that are listening now to see, hey, maybe I don't want this to be me type of thing. Right. Or, or it was me, and I won't do that again. Oh, ha ha. Yeah. I thought I was doing the best thing, and yeah. it turned out. Yeah. So, you want to start? You can start. Oh. I had, my first one was choosing the wrong type of pet. So. This is a really, this is probably <laughs> the biggest one, though, right? Don't like, you think? Yeah. I think this is the biggest I mean, every, one. Like, every day, I see an appointment or two that I'm just like, oh, it's really unfortunate. You love your, you love your pet. Yeah. But like, oh, wouldn't it have been better if you had this other breed or... Right. Yeah. So picking either... So give an example. So, all right. Let's say you have a, um, you know, older couple that, you know, likes to kind of keep things really chill and calm and, and, you know, maybe their big adventure for the day is going out for some coffee coffee and then coming back home. If they got a border collie puppy, it's super cute. Right. And really sweet and like needed a rescue, but it's a border collie. So ask any veterinarian and they will tell you that border collie wants to go fetch and run six hours a day. And yeah, that dog wants to work and that dog needs a job. And so they're living in their little townhouse. It's adorable. It's a cute little townhouse, but it's not a very big place. They don't have a yard. They don't have a yard. They have to walk the dog like eight times a day for it to be happy. So they're going to try to take it for its coffee and it's going to be like. I just want to run after some ducks or something. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So that's an example. Um, yeah. What's another I have, example? I mean, I have, I could think of, you know, you just want to get a cat. Well, a cat's not a cat. There's this kind of cat and there's that kind of cat. I'm not talking about breeds. I'm talking about personalities. Yeah. So, you know, if you live in a small apartment and you've never had a cat before or whatever, you might not want to choose a feisty calico kitten. Nope. Or a <laughs> young male cat that's right? gonna be you just might want to just it out. like talking about the fat cats maybe you want to pick one of those <laughs> maybe you want one of the pre-diabetics right no because <laughs> you'd be easier giving insulin than dealing with all the behavioral problems that come with cats you don't yeah. think about behavioral problems in cats but they're pretty significant oh they can and be, a lot of yeah. the time it's it's they're looking for stuff to do they're like yeah you know, these young male cats i had a couple of classmates in vet school they <laughs> One of which was my fault because we went to the shelter together. What I said, he wants class? you. He wants you. Look at this cute little kitten. Yeah. And she still has him to, ne- to this day. But he is a terror. He is yeah. this little orange male kitty. And he'll open up her kitchen cabinets. He'll knock out her food. I mean, he is a terror. So right. you do need to figure out that every cat, I mean, cats do. They have a wide variety of personalities. And so sometimes it's nice getting, instead of the kitten, that you really don't always know how that personality is going to pan out. Getting an older adult cat that yeah. the shelter has a little bit of a more of a grasp on right. what kind of personality this cat is, if it's going to be a good match for you. So, and you, we could go down this rabbit hole with any pet, yes. but you know, it, a lot of vets are actually happy to provide the service of consulting with you about a, a pet choice yeah. and take advantage of that. You may have to pay an office visit, you know, but fifty dollars or sixty dollars to talk with a vet and talk about what the options, the best options would be, it might be money well spent rather than having behavioral problems that cost you many hundreds or or even thousands of dollars. And it's funny, too, because we've had a few employees that have started here that um, have had no real animal experience, have come in, you know, to the animal field. This is their first time of being in a veterinary field or just around animals so much. And a few of them had certain breeds of dogs that they had wanted to get. And we said, nope. 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 Not that one either. <laughs> it's not going to be good for you. It's not going to be good. So it's really, you know, we see them. We've been here. We've been in this field. We, we know how those animals work. And so it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to kind of consult with one of your vets about what the right dog or cat might be for you. So what's your next mistake well, got, that are got, well-intentioned? We've we have got a little this, list. We have a list. Okay, so let's so go by our list. My list is, my next on my list is sort of making a self-diagnosis either via the internet or maybe via a breeder or pet store. What do you think about that? So I Again, think, well-intentioned. I, well-intentioned. So I do think that a lot of these places, pet stores, you know, breeders, <laughs> all of them, they do. They're going to come with, with their own experience, their own advice, and they're going to have, you know, 
recommendations for you. And that's fine, because a lot of that, I'm fine with you getting that information, but just don't forget about the veterinarians as well. So don't forget about the advice that maybe we have for you. Um, you know, we might look at some of the advice that's written out and it might be very opinion based and there might not be any you know data or studies or anything that's linked to maybe some of the stuff that they're telling you and so we're going to give you facts i mean we're going to give you sure we can give you some of our opinions too but for the most part we're going to back it up with certain facts you know as I far as i have to tell you what what one of the other doctors was saying about so advice i think that med, there's such a wide wide spectrum of advice from endologists, from breeders, for example. Yes. But know that the only the only true qualification to being a breeder is that you let two dogs fornicate. It's very true. Right? Now, most of them have a huge amount of knowledge yes. about their breeds. Yeah. But remember that there's a minimum level of training that a veterinarian has, and the minimum level of training to be a breeder is, is that, is yep. owning two dogs. Yep. And the minimum level of training for being in a pet store is just that you pass through an interview process. True. Right. Yep. So just don't forget the vets. Yeah. Don't forget us. Don't forget the advice. I mean, sometimes when they come out with very, um, you know, long lists of, you know, vaccine recommendations or, you know, things like that, you know, we have gone to school for this. We have you know, years of experience with this. We are following the guidelines that are set forth by, you know, experts in these fields. So, you know, if a breeder tells you he, this dog, this breed can never receive this type of vaccine or, you know, don't vaccinate until your dog is at least a year old for rabies or whatever, those things just aren't true. So we're going to give you our, our advice on that and as well. And you are free to choose which, you know, which advice, but just listen to us as well. And yeah. then, you know, in that same realm is the idea of, sort of self-diagnosis on Google, the funny thing is that, like, there's so much information out there, and a lot of it's actually quite good, and, and sometimes yeah. I like to tell people, go Google it, <clears throat> but then come to me and ask me all the questions that you have, Yeah. right? So yeah. we have a happy medium. I have, I have frequently had times where people were, like, coming to me, and they're so frustrated, and it's been six months that they've been dealing with the problem. They haven't once come in mm -hmm. to see me, but they have this bag of meds, that they bought on Amazon or something like yeah. that because they were like sure that it was going to help. Oh, yep. you should try this supplement or this or that. And you know, like spend like hundreds of dollars on these things. Right. When I'm like, okay, and so here's your bag of food that we're going to do, and this is going to fix it. Fix it. Now it's not always that simple. But, right. You know, don't. It's it's so much of a tendency. I do this myself. I go and Google the thing. Oh, it's so hard. And I'm like, I don't need to go to my doctor. I'm going to do this thing oh it's yeah. so hard because we have our phones our phones are all connected now with internet i mean it is so hard and it's so tempting not to <clears throat> do it but just like any websites certain websites are much more um fact-based than others and then not even just looking at the websites because sometimes you can go down a, a pathway that you think you're on a good website you think this is all the signs but it really isn't. I mean, there is an art to that medicine. There is an art to practicing medicine. So coming to us, talking to us, having us put the pieces together and talking to you about, you know, different different things is important. Okay, my next thing on our list was uh, not taking advantage of wellness care. It's so important. I mean, some, and I, I feel like this, oh, we lost it. This is Facebook Live. This is what happens. On Facebook Live, we get mics that go down. <laughs> I'm going to hold this, and Lauren over there, our producer. Is our producer. Going to try to reattach fix it. it. Son, you keep talking. I will keep talking. So, as far as for those that are listening on, a, on audio only, Chris's microphone just fell off. Yeah, the table. it's okay. That was the problem. Um, as far as. Uh, I don't even know what we were talking about, Krista. We were talking about wellness care. Oh, wellness care, yeah. yeah. So as far as wellness care goes, um, you know, very often people say, oh, well, I don't need to come, come in on a yearly basis. My cat's an injury-only cat. You know, it's my only cat. I don't, I don't need to do anything. But the problem with that is, is that, you know, 10 years down the line, your cat comes in and we do our physical exam. We say, okay, well, your cat has multiple dental lesions. Your cat has a heart murmur that you would have no idea about kidney your cat's kidneys are really super tiny your cat's been drinking a lot and maybe losing weight but we have no record of what the previous weight would have been because the cat hasn't been in its whole life so it is really great if you can get your pets in on a yearly basis have us do at bare minimum just a physical exam you know be able to at least kind of keep you in the loop of what's going on with your pet but wellness care is so important and the same thing goes with people i mean sometimes it's hard it was I need to, you know, go even see my human doctor, you know, to try to keep my wellness up. But it's really important for our pets. Um, overall health. I don't know. 
It's fine. Is it fine? Is it fine? Is the microphone oh, good? We're it's, back. It's, <laughs> it's a very... It's, do you know what? Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. It's our first time and... Oh, there it goes. All right. Is I that, think that works. Is that going to be that works. okay? Yeah. Okay. So wellness care is very important. You know, you can't forget that. And, and, you know, I brought up the cat example, but dogs are another great example too. I mean, you need to make sure that these dogs, you, all of your patients are getting yearly physicals. Even if your dog might not be due for a vaccine, it's still important to come in for that, that yearly yeah, it's physical always, exam. You know, the ones that just, you just feel like this dog is not, it's not like it's not well cared for, but like there's things I could have done for right. this dog, like maybe caught it before it was grossly obese or... You know, its coat doesn't look so fabulous. Maybe we could have changed its diet. And now they're like 12, and they're here for some problems, and it's really hard to sort out which of those problems is chronic and which of those problems is acute and what could I have done for this patient that now I'm kind of behind the eight ball and, yeah. and stuck with. And, and you just, again, like you spend less yeah. money in the long run if you keep up with the wellness care. Totally. And you just, everybody feels better and your dog lives longer. And on those same lines, I mean, when you're making an appointment with us, if you, let's say your cat hasn't been here for 10 years or your dog hasn't been here for seven years, <clears> and you say, well, he needs vaccines, but, you know, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, and, you know, he's been drinking a whole lot more, and I think maybe he's losing weight, or, you know, his coat looks really funny, he's losing hair in different places. You know, when you book those appointments, even though they might not be up to date on vaccines, don't book it for a vaccine appointment because we want to give you the appropriate amount of time that you need to talk about all of the issues that your pet might be having. So come in for those issues. Right. So that's my, our last one is tell the truth. And that doesn't mean judgy like you're purposely lying. Right. But like know that a little behind the scenes information is vets do schedule different amounts of time for different problems. So if you have vaccines, that's going to be a shorter appointment. And then you're going to, if you have you know, 10 other problems, we might schedule you for an hour. And actually a lot of it's don't even charge more for that. It's just a matter of us not being overwhelmed by this long list of problems that you have and wanting to address each and every one of them fully. And then everyone's happier as opposed to you come in, you say it was just for vaccines. We schedule you a 15 or 20 minute appointment and you leave and you blast us on a negative review or something saying like they didn't deal with all of my problems or they didn't fully communicate and we feel frustrated because we don't feel like you really were able to absorb all the information that we wanted or we yeah. didn't, you know, just, just tell what's going on. No, no judgment if you have no judgment. And, and it tells what's going on for those visits, but also for like, let's say your pet's coming in again because the skin infection never went away. And but also in reality, you need you, the anal sex done. Yeah, well, that's true. Or nails. Yeah, that's true. If you really want nails done, let us and know right away. And he's scooting. <laughs> no, but um. I mean, if the, if the let's say let's say your dog came in, you know, two months ago for a skin infection, and you're coming back in because the skin infection never went away, and in reality, you only gave three days worth of antibiotics. Right. Let us know that. Just tell us. So that's that we, okay. Yeah, let us know. Because gosh, I would way rather you were just it failed because we didn't give the appropriate course and you couldn't. And maybe we say, now we'll give an injection of antibiotics instead yeah, or something else, rather than if you say, yeah, I gave all of them, then we're like, okay, now we have to do a culture because we could have a resistant infection. Yeah. You do end up spending more or you say no, but you feel sort of guilty and then you're just going to take more antibiotics and like, just, yeah, just be honest with us. We, us we don't truth. care. We want to, we want to help and your pet and you. About what really happened. Yeah. Right. So yeah, you know, it ate a sock. But you feel pretty guilty because it ate a sock last week. <laughs> Just tell us it ate a sock. Yeah. We'll help you out. We'll help you out. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that was any, my list. I Do you have any sure. other things that you thought of um, while we were talking? Not really. I mean, we love we you know we, we love what we do. We love being here for you guys. So just be open and honest with us. We'll help you out. Yeah. Um, so last thing was I had one question on Facebook from, oh. a, from a friend. A oh, Facebook nice. Friend okay, perfect. Yeah, I like who this. Who asked... Um, I have a 21 pound dog. Okay. And I have 22 to 44 pound flea and tick product. Okay. Can I use it or do I have to buy a whole new product? You can use it. Right. Yeah. That is what I said. You can use it. Yeah. Yeah. So the safety margin on these things is huge. It is really good. It's nice. And it's nice too because when you do have those patients that let ride that line, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of want to go on the higher end right. anyway because it has a good safety margin. You want to make sure you have enough to make it work and be effective um so you can sort of go a little bit on that so just end. to be clear we are that is off label effectively so you are technically using it against the label instructions but on the recommendation of of veterinarians 
we don't say that you should take a 20 pound dog and give them the 80 pound dose but when you're on the border there we do often go up because you'll find it's more effective than going too low mm -hmm. and we also just like us pets weights fluctuate mm -hmm. you might weigh that same dog the next day and it's 21.5 pounds so or sorry 20, 20 22 pounds, yep. whatever um so it is okay on the borderline to to go ahead and give the higher thing but you're always advised to talk to your veterinarian about whether there might be problems that your dog has that's a good question right? i like that i like that that's right? a good question because if you're talking about some of the orals you might not yeah. want to go up in yeah. dose yeah. if your pet has seizures or something yeah yeah so. i like that that was a good question yeah so that's the end of our podcast today. You can always email us uh, at podcast at ethosvet.com. Yeah. Somewhere. You can find us on iTunes, iTunes and, Google, and Play. Google Play. And we do want to thank Ethos Veterinary Health for supporting us in this, as well as our fabulous producer, Lauren Paris. This is very exciting. We got you our new mic. with my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everybody.